Welcome to the top 12 highlights from chapter 9. I'm Mr. Rodman taking you through it. Are you living the five? We're going to talk about campaigns and elections today. A really great chapter. Lots of information in it. Hope you find this helpful. Remember, uh, number one to keep in mind is that elections are held on a specific number of uh, terms. So the first is a fixed term, which means every two years. The House of Representatives is up every two years. All 435 seats uh, up for election, re-election, whatever the case may be. We have a lot of safe seats. We have a lot of gerrymandered seats. Uh, but every two years, the entire House of Representatives is up for re-election. Do you mean even the Speaker of the House? Uh, is someone as powerful as the Speaker? Yes, everybody. Everybody is up in the House every two years. It is a fixed uh, term. So in the midterms, we see House of Representatives. In the presidential elections, we see House elections every two years. Now, the staggered ones, and this is where it gets a little confusing, is in the Senate. Uh, basically, uh, they're up every two years, uh, but only a third of them. So that way, by the time you get to every six years, uh, which is a Senate term, You've basically run through all 100 senators that have been up for re-election or election. Um, so every six years, a third of them are up for, for election. So you have 33, 33, 34, and that's how you end up with 100. Uh, so over the course of six years, you will see the entire Senate body um, uh, basically cycle through their their um, their election cycle for all 100 senators. Uh, but the reason why the founders and framers did this was to provide some continuity. Remember, the whole idea was uh, that there's the heated passions of the House and that the the calm deliberations of the Senate, uh, the, the cautious yet deliberative type of body that they are. Uh, and the way that you keep that continuity is by only uh, changing out a third of them so that uh, you, you don't lose everybody. You lose only a third if that was even to happen. But as we know, again, going back to safe seats or gerrymandering, uh, I guess that doesn't really apply here in the Senate, but but uh, in terms of getting out the vote for House seats, sometimes helps in getting out the Senate, uh, Senate uh, votes in some of those districts. And that can really make a difference. Uh, we also see that people who are senators don't run for as nearly long. Remember this from chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 11. Uh, the idea is uh, many of them go on to either run for president or become ambassadors or uh, become um, members of the cabinet. Uh, so uh, their, their tenure is usually shorter than members of the House, uh, usually about 10 years in the Senate, where in the House, you know, it could be 25, 30 years uh, that members are there. Uh, so, but we do see the, the overturning cycle every uh, six years with a staggering uh, two-year interval for a, a third of those Senate seats. And then the presidency, very limited in nature in terms of elections, it can only run for two four-year terms. So President Trump uh, running for his second uh, four-year term here in 2020. If he wins it, um, then he would be term limited by the 22nd Amendment. He could not run again. Um, and um, that is uh, how that works under the 22nd Amendment. So that's kind of given us a rundown on elections. Uh, I mentioned term limits. This creates, uh, can create what we call a lame duck, somebody who um, is running and can't run again. Um, it, usually it's after um, the election, uh, but some people say it's gotten earlier and earlier. So if a, a member of a Congress runs and loses, uh, they're still sitting in the Senate seat after the election until January. Um, they're basically a lame duck. They're somebody who's still serving in, in a legislative capacity, uh, but they're on their way out. Uh, so are they, they really have the interests of the people at hand uh, in so doing, and um, that's uh, where they get the, uh, the moniker of lame duck. Now, the Electoral College, we talked about this before, and I've got another great YouTube video um, on uh, five things you need to know about the Electoral College. I highly encourage you to watch that. I think you'll find it helpful. The magic number here is 270, um, and that is in order to win the presidency, you need one more than half of the total number of electoral votes, which would be the total number 538. Uh, half of them would be 269. One more than half would be 270. So in order to win the presidency, um, according to Article 2 of the Constitution, you need to win the Electoral College. And today, that is 270 electoral votes. Winner take all happens in 48 of the 50 states, that uh, exception being in Maine and Nebraska, where they award their votes proportionally. Uh, but the other states, you win the most votes in that state, you win the electoral votes for that state. Do you win it proportionally? No, you win all of the electoral votes. So it makes for a 
pretty quick night when you've got winner take all. Um, and remember, states decide how to conduct their elections. So if every state decided tomorrow they wanted proportional representation of the Electoral College, they could do that, just like Maine and Nebraska have done. They could do that as well. They haven't up to this point, but um, again, if you uh, watched my Chapter 9 Notes video, you would recall that uh, in if proportional voting had been used in 2012 in the Obama re-election years, Mitt Romney actually would have won uh, if they had changed to proportional voting. Uh, that's how different proportional voting is to winner-take-all. Uh, but that didn't happen. Uh, that's not how it works, and that's not how it worked then, and it's not how it works now. 48 of the 50 states have winner-take-all, and that's how elections are conducted. Uh, so uh, the magic number is 270. It will be 270 again in this map, uh, because while this is the 2016 Electoral College map, uh, and thank you, C-SPAN, for sharing that. Uh, it is also the 2020 map. Uh, the census is being conducted now, but a, the uh, Electoral College map will not change until uh, the census is completed. So uh, the, that, uh, those, the um, uh, reapportionment won't take place until after the census is done, which means the next uh, impact on that Electoral College uh, map would be 2024. Um, and you can see here a lot of the states that tend to vote one way or another, uh, as outlined by the little cartoon that we see here, really shows uh, that there's only a handful of states that you're really talking about uh, being swing states and trying to win. Now, is it possible to win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College? You betcha. Ask Al Gore or Hillary Clinton, because this happened to them. Uh, Hillary Clinton won almost 3 million more votes than Donald Trump. But... She lost the Electoral College, and as a result of doing that, she uh, lost the presidency. Al Gore did the same thing. He won 500,000 more votes than George W. Bush, but he didn't win the Electoral College. He didn't win Florida, and thus, um, being so close to, the, uh, to winning the Electoral votes, 266, only needed three more electoral votes. Had he won his home state, he would have been the president of the United States, uh, but he didn't. And as a result, he lost the Electoral College. He lost the presidency. And uh, in looking at the uh, the Clinton v. Trump race, you can see here in losing that uh, what was a Democratic blue firewall of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, uh, Trump was able to uh, win those states and thus uh, win 306 electoral votes in the election in the Electoral College and won the presidential uh, election of 2016. So if you uh, think that they that you can win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College, it is so true. Uh, the electoral process, number five, and looking at the uh, general election day is always the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Um, that is, uh, again, according to the Constitution in terms of how that takes place. Uh, that would be when citizens are voting for the electors. Uh, we always think we're voting for candidates, but we're really voting for the electors because, remember, states conduct elections. So when is the uh, state election day or the Electoral College Day is the Monday after uh, the um, uh, the second Wednesday in December, and that's when states would get together to cast their electors uh, in the Electoral College. So each state would gather in their state capital. Uh, that happens in Annapolis, in the uh, Maryland State House, and uh, that is when they would cast their votes for the Electoral College. Now, then they'll certify those. They'll they'll seal them and then mail them off to um, Washington. And the real election day is actually on January 6th, and that is when the Senate, uh, led by the vice president, the presiding officer of the Senate, would open the electoral certifications from all 50 states, will read them, and will count them, and then will determine who the electoral college winner is. And then that person will uh, prepare their, their victory speech and will announce on ja and January 20th, will take the oath of office at high noon in front of the Capitol, uh, and will take that oath of office on Inauguration Day. And then they will begin uh, their term of office, uh, whoever that may be. Now, some advantages of the Electoral College, it's quick, right? Uh, we know fairly quickly uh, that this process uh, is very quick. We would know by the 11 o'clock evening news who the winner is, okay? Uh, we also know that the Electoral College is supportive of the Federalist system. The idea of winner-take-all, uh, you give the state a role in conducting that election, and the state has that important role, uh, and they don't take it lightly. 
and that's why many of those states don't want to give it up. Um, but the intent uh, wasn't to be a popularity contest. It wasn't designed to be, oh, the whims of the masses are going to sweep in and, and uh, presidents are going to win. Uh, the hope was that the electors of the state would be more informed, they would have more knowledge of uh, the candidates that are running, and then would be able to make an informed decision on behalf of the voters uh, that have elected them as their electors. Now, some disadvantages it's really hard to understand. I mean, we've, we've you know, done the chapter notes. We've done the five things you need to know about the Electoral College. We talked about it here. But for the average voter, they don't understand the Electoral College. They never had Mr. Rodman in AP Gov class. Uh, many of them didn't have AP Gov. So they don't understand the process. And it's not an easy one for, for the average voter to understand. So it, it's kind of like, oh, you're stealing the election. Um, especially if you lose, you're looking at it going, why, why do we have this, this antiquated uh, system uh, that, uh, that tends to not match up with the popular vote in some cases? And to have two in the, uh, in the last 20 years really says something that two in the last five elections were basically um, splits between the Electoral College and the popular vote. Uh, so that doesn't encourage people to want to support it. Now, uh, keep in mind, um, that with this popular vote, uh, the, the person who wins the Electoral College may not win the popular vote. And as a result, um, we also have faithless electors. Uh, that hasn't really been a real problem. We, we've, we've seen those. We saw those uh, in 2016. We saw those in 2004. Uh, we saw those in 2008. Uh, even in 2000, we saw one uh, basically protesting the, uh, the system, the voting system in Florida. Um, but the point is, um, we have a system in place, and uh, until people change it by either adopting a, an amendment to the Constitution to change it, or um, going with a national popular vote, or uh, going with uh, something along those lines, you're stuck with it. It is the system that it is. Now, um, it can also be tied, which means, again, it goes into the House of Representatives. Each state gets one vote. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, if that um, if that had happened uh, in the uh, if, if that were to happen in the 2020 election, uh, the uh, Republican would win because uh, the the states tend to be predominantly red or Republican right now. Um, it's only based on population. Remember, the House is based on population, not on uh, equal re representation of the states. Um, but it's only based on that um, 435 uh, seats that you have a, a, a Democratic House. Otherwise, if it were um, just based on one vote per state, that would be a very Republican outlook, which is what you see in the Senate right now, which is why with two votes per state, you see a very Republican, uh, very conservative Senate as a result of that. So um, we've only had um, two situations in which uh, the election has been thrown into the House of Representatives, and that was with Thomas Jefferson in 1800 and John Quincy Adams in 1824. So, and we know how those turned out. Um, but I, I highly encourage you to watch the five things you need to know about the Electoral College. I, uh, I think you'll find it helpful and uh, an additional resource on better understanding the Electoral College and stuff you need to know in case you ever get a free response question on it, uh, which you never know. Um, this is always a fun one to take a look at. Uh, it is 270 toWincom uh, You can make uh, your own map, which is always kind of fun and exciting uh, to make your own map of the, uh, of the Electoral Race and then see how... Um, how they match up, uh, what are your predictions for 2020. They also have some maps that you can start with some of their predictions and then change it based on uh, some modifications you want to make there, but have some fun with that. Now, I mentioned safe seats. Uh, these are the ones that you're not going to lose, uh, and the reasons for that are because of incumbency advantage. The person who's currently holding the office is the one uh, that is running again, and and uh, they've been able to bring home the pork barrel spending, uh, bring home the bacon uh, to their district, and uh, people, as a result, love that, and so they're supporting them again. Um, and what 70% of the people that are running as incumbents usually win. Uh, gerrymandering has also helped with those safe seats uh, because they're more in your party's favor uh, in in terms of uh, a, a safer seat because there's more people from your party in that seat. Uh, the 6th District is a good example of this in Maryland uh, where um, in the uh, redrawing of the district lines in 2010, uh, as a result of the 2010 census, more 
um, Democrats were were funneled into the sixth district, thus tipping the scale and making it not a Republican district any longer, but now a Democratic one. So gerrymandering uh, gave that safe seat. Uh, and David Trone, the uh, the Democrat that's in that seat today, uh, as a result of a lot of that gerrymandering that took place there. Um, the coattails is another one. We haven't seen this happen as much. Um, there's always predictions about what's going to happen, but then it, it, we don't really see that um, necessarily uh, being pulled off. Uh, it was more popular in the 80s. Uh, or in the late 80s, early 90s, in terms of the coattails, a president that wins by a huge margin and brings lots of members in the House and Senate along with him. Um, we don't see as much of that today as we did back then. Now, remember, in a midterm election, uh, we talked about this. This is in between presidential elections. Um, in midterm elections, we see the president's party usually loses, um, and that was the case with Bill Clinton. That was the case with George W. Bush, uh, with uh, uh, Barack Obama and with Donald Trump. Uh, we, we saw the midterm elections, they usually lost seats. Now in 2018, uh, we saw the Democrats gain 41 seats in the House. Now that was up from 2016. Uh, but the D Republicans held on to the Senate. Uh, but we have seen those House seats change uh, in midterm elections. The president's party usually does always lose, and, and that is has been the case uh, for the, the last four presidents that we've seen. Um, New Iowa and New Hampshire are, um, are, are, are contests that start the race. We c held our, our uh, Iowa caucus in class where we voted with our feet in order to um, vote for our candidates for class president. And um, they are important because they are the first. Now, uh, after this whole app debacle, I'm not sure what's going to happen in terms of them being the first any longer, uh, but it does call into question whether or not they should be. New Hampshire, the first primary, didn't go quite as poorly uh, in terms of calculating the vote and getting a winner uh, with uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump being the winners in the New Hampshire primary, but they have been first in the nation status for a long time. And the question of front loading or moving your state up uh, so that you can get more attention uh, as a result of this has definitely caught on. Nevada is a good example of that. South Carolina, another. Um, and all the Super Tuesday states that went, uh, such as Texas and California and and uh, a number of uh, uh, states that we saw go in the Super Tuesday races uh, were really trying to move up their state in, in importance because they wanted to they wanted to get some action in on this too. They wanted to see some candidates and see some money coming into their state. Uh, that that is revenue there that you're you're looking at. Not to mention media exposure. Um, you're hearing people uh, being interviewed by uh, local media in your state and um, and as a result uh, of that media exposure uh, your state's getting more attention I mean who doesn't know about the chicken on a stick at the Iowa State Fair why because it's the first in the nation caucus and everybody who is a candidate has to go to the Iowa State Fair and eat chicken on a stick or see the giant cow made out of butter uh, because it's a rite of passage for someone who uh, wins the White House. Uh, that's the idea behind it. Now, uh, why do you as a candidate want to make sure that you're going to those states? Well, uh, for a lot of reasons, one of which is uh, you want to raise money. And it's easier to do that if you're the front runner. It's easier to do that if you're winning uh, at least a race. Pete Buttigieg uh, winning the Democratic caucus in Iowa uh, was able to raise a lot of money around that and get a lot of media exposure. Um, now, even though they, they that was kind of a, a hot mess in terms of how they conducted it, the idea was the same. He was at least able to say, hey, we came close to, it looks like we were going to tie with Bernie or something. Um, and Bernie was able to raise money around it too. So uh, that media exposure definitely helps in terms of raising money and getting attention. Now, um, the um, the big enchilada for this chapter is really campaign finance highlights. Uh, so uh, if you want more detail on this, I highly advise you go over to the chapter notes uh, that I think you'll find helpful with this. But I'm going to run through campaign finance highlights here in terms of the FEC that was created in order to try and bring about change in terms of money in elections, trying to make it a fairer process, one that was more above board and, and uh, could be pretty seen in the light of day. Um, the FEC was created, the Federal Election Commission created, and uh, as a result of the uh, Federal Election Campaign Act, we see um, 
people being limited by how much money they can raise for an individual uh, election for a campaign. Uh, the candidates themselves that are running are um, limited in terms of what they can raise. It's going to be based on inflation. Uh, that number today is $2,800. I can write a check for $2,800 to any candidate that is running. I can do that in the primary. I can write that same check again in the general election, meaning I can give them up to and including $5,600. I can also write them a check to their political action committee, which was created as a result of FICA. Uh, the PACs um, collect up to $5,000 per PAC. So if I have five PACs, you can donate $25,000 to my PACs. Uh, and that that uh, expands the amount of donations that you can make to um, a, a campaign and a candidate. Now, Buckley Vileo said, if you are rich and you have lots of money, can't you spend it on your own campaign? Donald Trump sure did. Well, in Buckley v. Vileo, it was a 1976 case, and it said, yes, uh, if you have money you want to spend, and it's you or your spouses, not your kids, not your grandkids, uh, not your parents, uh, but if it's your money, and you and your spouse want to spend it on a campaign, go right ahead. That's your free speech rights. Um, and that essentially opened the, the floodgates to people spending money in their own campaigns. Now, BCRA came along in 2002 and uh, the McCain-Feingold bill and said, okay, uh, political parties are starting to get out of control. They're, they're raising soft money in addition to hard money, uh, those campaigns. Hard money being uh, the, the, the checks you write for $2,800. Soft money being party building purpose money that they can can collect and it was a ratio like if you collect one hard money check in, in uh, of twenty eight hundred dollars you can collect you know two or three soft money checks uh, amounting to you know ten thousand dollars or whatever the case may be I don't remember the exact number but uh, it's banned under uh, McCain Feingold uh, and that uh, was upheld by the Supreme Court within constitutional scrutiny even under Citizens United but it basically said um, Soft money being banned by these political party building purposes. Uh, if you want to raise money, do so outside the campaign. An independent expenditure, which means an independent of the candidate, independent of the campaign. Um, so that gave rise to 527s, which is what we see today. Um, so BCRA was successful in limiting those individual campaign, campaign contributions. Supreme Court said, we understand that, that, that being limited to $2,800 or whatever it was adjusted for inflation. We get that. That makes a whole lot of sense. But if you want to do it uh, in other ways, um, you, you've, uh, you've got to go outside. You've got to use the independent expenditure approach, which is what we see in 527s. Uh, this BCRA basically gave birth to 527s, the idea that tax-exempt organizations could use issues, not candidates, uh, not advocating for or against a candidate, um, and not be affiliated with a candidate. Remember, it's an independent expenditure. It's independent of the campaign. Uh, but the idea was they couldn't advocate for or against a candidate. They can do a little more of that now. Um, but they uh, could be issues oriented and they could advocate. Uh, and one of the most famous ones is in the Kerry race, uh, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth basically uh, said, uh, we we don't know if we can trust this guy. And basically, uh, as that being an issue, uh, didn't advocate for him, didn't advocate against him, didn't advocate for George W. Bush, didn't advocate against him, but it really showed the power of 527s. Um, we will eventually know how much money they raise and who, who donates, uh, but the money is um, has to be reported to the FEC over time, not right away. So you can raise all kinds of money before the election. You can pay a fine and miss the filing deadline and then uh, dump the information after the election's over, and who cares, right? Who cares in terms of how that, that is carried out? Um, the, um, the super PACs uh, were given away as a result of Citizens United, which I'll talk about in a second. But super PACs are basically an independent expenditure that really it becomes some dark money. Uh, we don't know who's donating. Uh, we will over time because they do have to file reports with the Federal Election Commission um, and with the IRS. But we really don't know... Um, and like I said, before the election, uh, they may not meet the filing deadline. They may have to pay a fine and turn it in after the election, which takes a lot of the pressure off uh, in terms of who's donating and how much. They have to be completely independent, completely separate from the campaign, but they can raise unlimited amounts of money. Uh, they don't 
have to uh, have any limits whatsoever on who donates, how much they donate, or how often they donate. And that becomes uh, the real dark money that we see in the campaign. Uh, in 2016, we saw hundreds of millions of dollars being raised by super PACs as a result of uh, this ruling, as a result of Citizens United. And then we get to the darkest of the dark money, and that's the 501c4s. This is money that doesn't have to be reported to the FEC ever. As long as this organization is a 501c4, a tax-exempt, uh, not-for-profit organization, they must advocate um, uh, uh, be, be issues-oriented for non-political purposes, non-political purposes, 50.1% of the time. Then they can advocate for or against issues and can, or, or candidates uh, the 49.9% of the time, as long as they are completely independent of the campaign completely separate of the campaign they can raise unlimited amounts of money they don't have to disclose their donor lists they have to report to the irs and that is it there's no fec requirement this is the darkest of the dark money and we don't even know how much money we're talking about here because unlimited amounts are being raised and there's no limits and there's no reporting so where we saw hundreds of millions of dollars in super PACs we can probably say we see even more of that coming through 501c4s. Now, the contribution limits, as I mentioned, 2800 per election. The idea here is uh, to limit individuals, their donations. I can donate that per election, which means I can donate that in the primary and again in the general election. Um, and so some of this money you can follow. Some of it you can't, uh, but the idea is 527s. Eventually, I'm going to see what money is being donated there. I'm going to see who's donating. Corporations, they can set up a super PAC. Eventually, we'll see what kind of money is being funneled in there. But 501c4s, the darkest of the dark money. We'll never know who donated and in what amounts. It's the darkest of the dark money, and it is having an impact on elections and campaigns, even as we speak. Uh, in terms of where the money goes, we know that's where the money is going today. It's going into the outside groups. There's lots of money being raised by, uh, by candidates, by PACs, um, by these organizations with, affiliated with the, within the campaign. But in terms of where the money is going, it's going outside. And we just don't know enough about it in order to, to uh, be able to determine. Um, we know it's having a huge impact, but um, to what extent the money's being raised, uh, we know it's a, a large amounts of money because they're spending it. They're spending it on campaign commercials to advocate for and against candidates. Uh, they're spending it in nonprofit purposes. Um, and um, it's having a significant impact on elections today, much more than we saw in 2008. Uh, quite a difference uh, than, we've, than, we, than, um, than we saw in, in previous presidential elections and even midterm elections. All right, Citizens United, this idea that... Um, uh, they overturned some things, they upheld other things. So some of the things that they overturned, they said, corporations and unions, you are people too, and you have free speech rights. If you, as a corporation, uh, want to collect money and, and, and spend that money, you have the free speech to do it. Uh, and, and we overturned the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, BCRA. We're overturning that in this capacity. Now, um, individual campaign spending, we're going to keep those limits. Banning soft money by political parties, we're going to keep those limits. But in terms of uh, outside groups spending money, as long as they're not affiliated with a campaign, they can go out and spend as much as they want to. And this is what gave birth to super PACs. This is what gave birth to the 501c4s. It was this case, a 5-4 to four ruling, very close, landmark case, uh, and really made the difference because now outside groups can raise unlimited amounts of money, don't have to report that at least right away uh, for super PACs, but uh, never with 501c4s, and they're having significant impact on, um, on campaigns and elections today. One other case to mention, McCutcheon, uh, basically was uh, prior to uh, the Citizens United case, uh, even after that, they, they didn't touch the cap. There was a cap through BCRA that was placed on uh, campaign spe spending, an individual was capped at about $102,000. They could spend money on uh, a handful of campaigns, up to 50, 49, 48, whatever the case may be, and basically could spend no more. Once you donated to, to the $102,000 cap, you couldn't donate again. 
the Supreme Court said, mm, we don't like that ruling. That actually says that, that your free speech is limited, and we don't like that option. So they basically said it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of your free speech rights, and said if you want to spend $2,800 per person for every person running for Congress today, you have the right to do that. You can do that. Um, and uh, we don't know why you'd do that, but if you want to do that, that's your option. It's a violation of free speech, and uh, you have every right to do so. So, um, so there you have it, uh, in terms of their in terms of their free speech rights and what they've got. Hope you found this helpful in the chapter nine top twelve highlights on campaigns and elections. Live the five, Viva El Cinco. Hope you found this helpful, and uh, definitely um, reach out if you have questions or comments, and we will, uh, good luck on the uh, quiz, test, or AP exam, and we will see you in chapter six.